Let it come from your heart. Give glory to the one who deserves glory. I thank you, Daddy. I honor you for life. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. The only one who does not change. There is no one like you. Thank you, Daddy. We bless your name. Katalana Satalama Shatale. Rebale Katasantra Le Poste Koto Jalama Satra Debo Shatalea. Baratala Kasata Helie Poshata Lema Sapragade. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to the Lord. Glory be to the Lord. Glory be to the Lord. Hallelujah. exalt you above all names the only one who is mighty thank you for the privilege I have to know you thank you for the privilege we all have to have access to you thank you for your love your loving kindness you said you will show mercy upon whom you will show mercy thank you for mercy thank you for your kindness to us we are grateful Lord We are here in your presence this morning to learn of you. Open our understanding. Minister grace, minister life. Jesus said, the word I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I request that the word of God quicken our understanding. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for answer prayer. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Hallelujah. Please sit down in the presence of God. I want to welcome you to the presence of God this morning. I know that God is good. Is it good to you? Yes, God is good all the time. Let me repeat this information before I go to the Word of God. From Monday 13th of May to Tuesday 21st of May, our outreach is 1,000. Our outreaches will be in Baruba land in Kwara State. And uh, we will do three crusades there. 
three days in uh, a place they call Bakuturu. Bakuturu. Three days in uh, another place they call Tula Kawuo. Those are two different villages, but in between them, they will bring all of them together. Tula, Tula Kawuo. And the last three days in Moshibola, Moshibofa. I don't know if I got it right. Calling the name Moshibofa. Do you know it? I'm better than you. You don't know it. Me at least. <laughs> Praise God. By the time we come back, we will be able to tell you the correct pronunciations of those names. But I'm sure I know Pakuturu. I know that one. So we covet your prayers. And if you can give, please do. You can use our FCMB account number 0306-153012 for Ulu Agbemiga Ulu Ushoyo Christian World Outreach. Number two, for people who have been with us for some time, you will remember that our crusade activities were intensified in July 2020 after I was taken to heaven, after the Lord showed me paradise and uh, hell. And I told myself, I told God, I would do everything in my power to stop as many as I can stop from going to hell. Since then, we have been doing crusades. Well, of course, we have, before, since 1985, I have been doing crusades. Crusades in villages, in towns, and so on. But after that encounter in 2020, things took a new dimension. Now, in that encounter, Jesus instructed me to do outreaches in the interiors villages and small towns for four and a half years. Four and a half years since 2020. And if you count that, this year is the last of those four and a half years. By December this year, the four and a half years will be over. Then we are supposed to begin citywide crusades for 10 to 15 years. When he said 10 to 15 years, I, I asked him, why are we saying 10 to 15 years? He said, because it will depend upon your strength. That's my strength. By, by, by 10 years, I will be 70. By 15 years, I will be 75. He said, it will depend on my strength, if I can go. So, I don't know yet. 10 to 15 years. The four and a half years are almost complete. And the Lord has instructed me that our citywide crusade will begin in Ilefe in January next year. That is still a bit far away. And we will need a lot of money for it. For that crusade itself, we need a lot of money. But the expenditure of that crusade has not started yet. Maybe it will start around October, November this year. That's when we'll begin to do radio adverts, television adverts, and things like that. So, we have not started spending on that crusade yet. But we need to get the equipment needed for such large meetings now. Whatever equipment we have now are not good enough. We just did a stage and um, we need many more things. We need bigger vehicles to carry our equipment. We need 911 trucks. We need 4x4 four four pickup vans. We need SUVs. We need video cameras. We need scaffoldings. Sound systems. 
floodlights, generators, speakers, you know. <clears throat> Those things are very expensive, you know. Very expensive. Let me not uh, trouble you by telling you how much. Unless you really want to know, then I will respond. Floodlights, electric cables, ordinary cables. If you know how much, <laughs> if you know how much cables are now, well, at least those of you who build houses, you know how much cables have become. The other time, one house we were finishing, I went to buy cables for it. We spent over one million buying wire. Yet the wire was not enough. So you can imagine bigger cables for for crusades. We need a lot of money. So if you can be of assistance to us, it will be great. Just reach out to me and we will give you further details if you need them. Send me an email or we'll show you at uh, yahoo.com. Or talk to me if you see me. If you don't, if you don't see me, just send me an email. Praise God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Let's settle to the work of today. Last week I told you one terrible thing that must not be allowed in uh, the new Nigeria. And that is bloodshed. I, I pleaded with you, I prayed for you, that you will not be a shedder of blood. I pleaded with you, that you should avoid anything that will involve shedding human blood. Because it will have terrible impact upon your life, and it will have terrible impact upon your generation, and it will also have a backlash upon our nation. I told you that one of the reasons why Nigeria had struggled in failure over many years is bloodshed. There have been so much of human lives wasted in Nigeria. That's what I told you last week and I don't want to go over that again. Today I want to focus on another one which is child abuse. Child abuse. Children abuse is one of the problems that destroy the old Nigeria. And this must not continue in the new Nigeria. We must put an end to the abuse of children for Nigeria to actualize her full potentials. You know why? Because our children are meant to be our strength. Our children are meant to be our future. As long as we continue to abuse the children, we are destroying our tomorrow. We are destroying the great, great future that God has for us. Look at Psalm 127. And let me read to you from verses 3 to 5. Psalm 127 I'll read to you from verse 3. Psalm 127. I'm reading starting from verse 3. He said, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Hallelujah. I know, I'm sure you know that scripture. If you look at it again, he said children are our heritage. They are our reward. Our children are our reward. They are not meant to be our problems. 
But if you don't have correct perception to put them in the home where they belong, they might become your trouble. Everyone has capacity to raise children. Whether you are male or you are female, we have capacity to have children of our own. Even our babies that are just born, although they have not started rearing children, they have the capacity, they have the potential to have children. This is one grace that God gave to every man. Be fruitful and multiply. It's meant to be a strength. It's meant to be a blessing, not to be a trouble. And I'm trying to let you understand that for Nigeria to actualize its full potentials, we must begin to put our children in proper placements. We must strengthen our children, raise them properly, so that they can take us to realms that we wouldn't have attained by ourselves. The Bible says children are our heritage. They are our reward. When you talk about reward, you are talking about gain. You are talking about benefits. Your children are meant to be a gain to you. They are meant to be a benefit to you, not a problem. But when you don't have correct perception, and you don't put the children in the home, in the family where they should be, then they will become your trouble. There are some people who get everything in skirts pregnant. Some men, they just go around, just sleep around. Sleep with this one, sleep with that one, sleep with that one. And get everybody pregnant everywhere. Yeah, maybe he's a mechanic. No, maybe he's a, he's, a, he's a carpenter. He goes to work in Lagos. He will get one girl pregnant there. He goes to work in Kaduna. He will get somebody pregnant there. He goes to work in uh, uh, Kapan, Kapansha. Another one is pregnant there. And he thinks that makes him a great person. Uponu niya uponu. You are just raising children anyhow. Having children everywhere. Even lunatics on the streets, you see them. Lunatic. You see them get pregnant. Is it angels that get them pregnant? Some men will still go and sleep with those pregnant, I mean those, those, those lunatics and get them pregnant. And raise children that don't even know who their father is. Raise children who don't even know who, who you know, you can, you can imagine what, ha- what will happen in the psyche of a child that starts life realizing that his mother is a lunatic. That's good enough. There's nothing he can do about that. But then, who is his father? He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. Now, what do you think that child will look like in human society? What kind of life do you expect from that kind of a child? And some men don't care. They don't think. They just do all those kind of things. Such children cannot be your reward. They cannot be your reward. They can only be your trouble. Not your trouble alone. There will be trouble to everybody. Trouble upon the nation. Look at verse 4 again. He said, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. That is, you know, they are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. The, the warrior, when he's about to fight a battle, his confidence is in the strength of his arrows that he carries in his hands. And he aims an arrow and, and shoots the arrow expecting to pull down something by, by, by shooting that arrow. 
You can aim your children in the right direction and shoot. And they will bring you great joy. Great joy. I, 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 I can't ever forget. I, 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 I think I said it here before. How I, I was traveling somewhere, maybe to Canada or somewhere, and I can't remember where I was going. And I traveled through Amsterdam. As we were filing out from the plane, you know, normally you come out, everybody, you are coming out into the, into the airport. I walk past, I was, you know, when you are connecting with another flight, you are in a hurry to get to your flight. You don't want your flight to go uh, before you get there. So you just want to keep going. I was just going, and I started hearing border, border, border behind me. And I said, ah, who can be shouting border here? Because Amsterdam, they don't speak English. They don't even speak, why would they speak Yoruba? They don't speak. So where is border coming from? And the border was even so, you heard the way I call it border. It was local, local, local border. Border, border, border. I said, ah, who can be? Who can be calling border in that place? So I, I had to look behind. I said, I have said so. I have said so that you are not going to be So I turned very well. I said, Ah, yeah. It will be me. So I was forced to speak Yoruba to her also. And we began a conversation. She was trying to get information about the flight. And you know, they wrote the documents, they wrote some of it in, uh, in uh, Dutch and then English. They didn't imagine that there would be somebody <laughs> who would speak either of those two languages. And here she was. She doesn't speak any other language than Yoruba. So she couldn't even read the document they gave to her. She doesn't know what, where to connect her flight. So she carried the paper in her hand. She didn't know. And everybody around her didn't understand. So she was waiting for a Yoruba man to pass by. So I gave her the help I should give her. And uh, we, we started a conversation. I said, but where are you going? She said she's going to America. I wanted to say, Kini <laughs> Runyu, what, what will somebody like you be doing in America? Why are you going to America? She said, my daughter is there. She gave birth to a child. And I'm going for Omugo, you know. She's going to take care of the child. I said, ah, ah. Now, wow. How did you obtain visa? Because I have seen professors who want to obtain visa and were denied. I have seen rich men who were denied visa. This woman had nothing. Even her dressing, you will know that... Uh, but it was her daughter that had a baby. And the daughter had a work. She had a family in America. And she has a right to invite her mother. No embassy will say no to her. They had to give her the visa. I, I shook my head. I said, our children are strong. We don't know how powerful our children are. Because they look so small when you just give birth to them. Train them right. Show them the right ways to go. And watch them grow. Watch them become mighty in your hands. I'm a small, small fellow. But in my few years... I have I've pastored so many people. 
I've seen kids. Ten years, five years, seven years. I see them rise. I've seen them become great men today. Scattered across the world. You don't know what your children will become in your hands. That's why you must not abuse them. Abusing your children is not the way to go. Your children are arrows in your hands. And you never can tell how far they will take you. So if you invest in your children when they need investment, they will separate you from shame in your old age. That's what that scripture is telling you. Look at, look, look at that scripture again. Look at, look at verse 5. He said, Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with their enemies in the gates. You see a lot of people cruising around in fine cars. When you ask them questions, they will tell you it's their child that bought it for them. You see some people living in fine houses. You realize it's their children that built it for them. Many, many great things that children do for parents. And they do it with joy. You don't need to beg them to do it. Just train them. Raise them properly. And leave the rest in the hands of God. It is God that will do the rest. Anyhow, let me go on to point number one. Have as many children as you can really take care of. Don't, don't be like a kweda. Huh? You know a kweda now? A bill money, money to a kweda. That's a silly thing for a human being. Raising children anyhow. Just raise children. Raise children. Because your wife can get pregnant. Because you have sperm. You just continue to pour. The northern Nigeria is the poorest part of Nigeria. Is the poorest part of Nigeria. And the main reason for that is the error of raising children like animals. They just give back to children anyhow. You can see a man who is a gate man. And we have ten women raising children for him. He may marry all of them, he might not marry them, he might. But there are ten of them raising children for him. And those women will be competing. Each one of them will have like seven children for the same man. Ten of them. Seven children. That's how many? Seventy. Clap for him. You should clap for him. Shouldn't you? And he's a gate man. The income he earns cannot take care of him alone. But he has 70 children. Seven women. Oh, ten women. That makes how many? Uh, children. Is ch- children. 80 plus himself. 81. Whereas he actually has capacity to take care of one person. Unfortunately, that foolish man has created a problem for the entire community. That is the worst form of child abuse. From birth, that child has all those children have come into trouble from birth. They have come into trouble because there was no plan 
for them. And that's the root of poverty in the north. But it's not limited to the north. It's also here. And I'm trying to let you know that the way forward is that you can have only the children we can care for. Now in the days of our fathers, it was acceptable for them to have plenty of children and then you can deposit some of your children with your uncle, you deposit some of them with your auntie. You don't even need to tell them ahead. They just, they just arrive with their bag. And they just settle down. And like that, they are welcome. Because in those days, they were farmers. They were farmers. Farmers. The more hands they have, the better. So, you bring additional two. You bring additional five. They are welcome. Is it not... They go to the farm, they eat, they see things, to, they eat yam there. It's part of what they plan that they are going to eat. So, they don't mind them coming. But today, how many of you are farmers? Huh? You are a farmer. You are in salary. Somewhat, they are paying you a particular amount of money. The moment there is a salary being paid to you, you are already leveled and graded. That means you, 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 you are limited by your income. Even those of you who say you who do business, you are limited by the income you make. How do you take care of those excess baggage in these days of hiking fuel price? How much, how much are you buying fuel now? I, I, I I didn't. I haven't bought fuel this week. Ma, sir, nine hundred per liter. Now, in the days that fuel we just jump like that, you think you can bring a child to my house now and I will welcome the child? School fees is jumping. Everything is jumping. You just bring a child now and say, eh, "Uncle." <laughs> Cement price has jumped. Food has jumped. Everything has jumped. Who will take care of excess, excess children for you? Before we got married, my wife and I, we held a meeting. We held a meeting. You know, the period of courtship is a time of uh, a lot of meetings, plannings, arrangement for your life. Our courtship was five and a half years. We had good time to plan. So we sat down. How many children are we going to have? I said, my mother, my mother had eight children. I think it would be good if I have four. She said her own mother had three. It would be good if she had two. <laughs> and we began negotiation. We negotiated among ourselves. And we agreed that it should be three. Is that not fair? Somebody wanted two, somebody wanted four. We agreed on three. And we concluded on how the children should come. How, how do we have them? This one, will, the first one will come after the first uh, three years of our marriage. Two years. Yes. After the first two years, we will have the first one. And then we will rest. And then we have another one after three years. And then we will rest. And then we have another one after three years. That's what we agreed on. And we plan our life. Arranged it. I said, I, I, we agreed that it would just be three of them. It doesn't matter what sex is there. 
three children. Because whether your child is female or male is not what matters. So. No. It is what you pump into that child. If he is female and he carry grace, he will do better than male children. If he is male and you abuse him, hey, he will be worse than any good thing, any bad thing you have ever had. So it's not the sex of the child. It is what you invest into the child. We had three of them. Fantastic children. We are proud of each one of them. And we will always be proud of them. Have as many as you can handle. It's not even financial power alone. What about the emotional commitment to the children? Do you know that each child is different from another one? Ah! We have three children. There are no two of them that look alike. That are alike. Mm -mm 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 -mm. They may look alike, but they are not alike. Emotion-wise, no. They are different from each other. The commitments that each child needs is different from each other. So before you have children, plan it well. The worst child abuse is to have children anyhow. Be more kiri, oh, be more kiri. Eh? I want my girl, I want my girl, die. Your children will become your own enemy, your own children. They become your enemy. Your own children. Because of the way you brought them up. And why won't, why won't it be difficult when you have too many to handle? They say, ah, come, come on, leave me alone. Amen, come on, how many? So no bear go to build. When you were multiplying, was the child consulted? Now you are now, you are now aggressive against the child because he's asking for money. Because he's asking for school fees. No, you are being wicked. You are abusive. That's number one. Number two, we must put our names to Almajiri culture. Almajiri culture. Almajiri culture is in the north, northern Nigeria. And people like you may not know what I'm talking about if you are not close to that culture. Actually, it's a fallout from the last point I, I made. You know, the last one I made was that having children anyhow. In the north, they had children anyhow. And because they could not care for their many children, parents in the north will normally send the boys they will send them out from their tender ages to go and live with a cleric a Muslim and Islamic cleric as apprentices as servants so they, they will go and live with that cleric and he is the one who, would, who is supposed to take care of them they are, they are students, actually, but, but they, they depend on their teacher for their food, for their upkeep, the house they will stay in, and all of that. So normally, they will just dump them in the mosque. They will be sleeping in the mosque, and uh, they will be eating whatever food they find. Because even the cleric himself is hungry. <laughs> he doesn't have food himself for himself. So, they are on their own. And these kids are always so numerous. That's the root of all this uh, Boko Haram and all those evil that is happening. Because the families could not take care of their many children. They send them to the clerics. 
The clerics cannot take care of them. They throw them to the streets. After they do the early morning pre- uh, teachings, they send them out to go and bring food. To, <laughs> to go and look for food and all of that. In the streets. And you can imagine small boys who are very hungry. They can do anything to get food. Anything. Anything. I have accosted them a few times. You know, we passed through the north many times. I was passing through Kano some times ago. And we wanted to eat in a local restaurant. When the first thing I noticed was there were plenty, plenty, what do you call them, flies everywhere. But that's, it looks like that's normal in the north. Plenty flies. But apart from plenty flies, there were plenty kids. There were over 300 kids around that restaurant. 300 kids. They're just milling around, watching, walking around, fighting among themselves, saying all kinds of So I said, what's this about? They said, ah, no, they are just doing their own thing. So I ordered my food. It's a, it's a local restaurant, so it's not. It was after that I decided that you should better go to the refined restaurants. You know, since you have been traveling with me, we never go to local restaurants. That's how I learned my lesson. Because the local restaurants are cheaper, and sometimes their food is more meaty, more. Some to us, something like that. So I said I prefer this one. And they served me my food. I sat down, I was eating. I saw that those kids were looking at me. I'm like, why are they looking at me like this? Why are they looking at me like this? These children must be hungry. I didn't know what it was. You don't know how hungry those kids are. I was just eating my food. And then I had a phone call. So I was receiving the phone call. Receiving phone call. When I finished my phone call, my mind was to come back and continue my food. There was no food on the table again. <laughs> Plus the meat plus everything. I said, what happened? And then I saw them. They were all fighting over the food. I didn't say, come and carry my food. I didn't give my food away. Look at them fighting over the food. And then somebody said, welcome to the north. That's the way it is here. When you are eating, you don't receive phone call. <laughs> you finish your food. They, they are waiting for you to stop eating so that they come and pack it. And they expect you to leave some for them. So the moment you stop and you start doing something else, they accept that you have, uh, you have finished. And they carry your food. And they finish it for you. That's the Almagiri culture. But it's not the food, my food that they ate that is the subject. Imagine what those kids go through every day. Now, I, they could pounce on my food because I was a stranger. I didn't understand that they would do that. Those who know that they would do that will finish their food before they receive phone call. So, who gives food to those ones? No food for them. They fight, struggle over nothing. Do you think, think those children will become something good in life? They can never become something great in life. No, it's not possible. But they were born like every other child was born.
So it's a terrible thing to have children and put them through those kind of life. Now, but most of us in the West, here in the South, we don't, we don't do the Amajiri thing directly. We don't send our children to Muslim clerics. But we send them to Onku. We send them to Auntie. We still do the same thing. As long as you take your children to another person, you are an abuser of children. I don't care who you are. I don't care who the auntie is. Don't send your children to anybody. Nobody can take care of your children like you will take care of your children. Nobody would take that role from you. Raise the children that you can care for. If it's only two you can handle, have just two. If it's only three you can handle, have just three. If you are stronger than us now and you can take four, okay. But I don't know how strong you will be that you take five. Except for those who are old, who have had them before now. Somebody say, I want to, ah, now I want to have a special child. What special child you have? Come on, go and sit down somewhere. The one you have had before, go and make them special. There's no child who comes special. It's the way you treat the child that makes him uh, special. So, don't follow the Amajuri culture. Don't send your children to anybody. Don't send your children around. Take care of them by yourself. Tell your neighbor, take care of your children by yourself. Number three. Early marriage for girls. Now, the second side of the Amajuri point is early marriage. The small boys, they send them to Almagiri. The small girls, they send them to marriage. And both of that problem came from problem number one, having too many children. When you have too many children, you'll be looking for solution. What will I do with all these children? What will I do with all these children? So the boys, you send them to Almagiri. The girls, you marry them off. When you marry a girl out in early tender age, you are, you are killing that child. You are destroying the child. It's a terrible case of child abuse. When I, when I served... I served in Akwaibom. I had a colleague who was colleague I said, not already. I had a colleague who was also a copper, a copper colleague, who was from Zamfara State. It wasn't a state at that time. It was Shokoto State then, but Zamfara was the present day Zamfara. That's where he came from. And then one day we were having a conversation. And he pulled out a a picture from his, uh, from his small wallet. He said, Olu, he he normally called me Olu. He said, Olu, come, come see my wife. I said, where is your wife? And he point, he showed me the picture. I, I, I looked at that picture. Very tiny girl. I said, ah, this girl can be more than seven years old. He said, yes, a seven year old. Now my wife, I married her last year. When she was six years. He said, yes. Ah. I couldn't believe what, was, what I was hearing. You know, I'd read it in, I'd read it in literatures. But... Seeing it physically, it was shocking to me. And this was a graduate. 
was a graduate, well educated, had a child of six years old as his wife. As his wife. Now, how could a girl of six years, seven years, even ten years, decide who she wants to marry? That's a terrible abuse. What you have done is you have pushed her into a life of slavery. You have pushed that child into a life of sorrow. A child of six years, she doesn't know they are, are left from her, right? Child abuse. It's a terrible child abuse. You know, to vote for election in Nigeria, you must be 18 years old. Am I, am I correct? Why? Because we assume that before you are able to vote, you must be able to know your left from your right. You don't know anything before you eat. Uh, how can you be voting? Now, if somebody cannot vote unless she's 18 years old, how then can you imagine that such a person is competent to decide who she's going to marry? Well, of course, in most cases, they don't even allow them to decide. They don't allow such a girl to decide. It is the parents that just bundle him into marriage. It's a terrible child abuse. Something that must stop. Now for, for us, we don't do it so early. But, but even when they are grown up, we still try to decide who they marry. We still try to compel them who they should marry. It's also child abuse. Let a child decide who she wants to be with. Let a, your boy decide who she, he wants to marry. They should be able to decide all of that. It's child abuse to dictate to your child who she must marry. Number four, lack of education for kids. Lack of education for the kids. In Nigeria today, the West is the most civilized and developed part. The West is the most developed and, de- uh, and the civilized part of Nigeria. Today, you know I travel a lot, so I know what I'm talking about. The West is the most developed part. Is the most civilized part of Nigeria. And you know the reason for that? It was because the action group government that ruled, Niger- that ruled the West in the first, uh, first uh, democracy. What do you call that one now? Because they had a policy of free compulsory education. Free compulsory education. They had that culture, that law. If your child is not allowed to go to school, you could be arrested. They made it compulsory. And everybody was compelled to go to school. At least at the primary level. In those days. And that's the reason why our society is better developed than all the other societies in in, in, uh, Nigeria. But right now, education is no longer that popular in the West. In this West. It's it's no longer that uh, popular. The other day, before we did this fence, I, I remember I used to live here then. I was working in my office there. There was no fence. And it was in the night. You know, my light was on. Everywhere was dark. 
I put on generator, I was doing my own work. Suddenly, somebody, I didn't even hear him get there. He stood be, behind my window and started talking to me. Good evening, sir. I said, good evening. Who is this? So, He said, it's our fast. It's our fast, so so and so. Okay. I don't know him. What can I do for you? He said, there's no food for him, for his wife, for his family. And uh, I should please give him something to eat. So we began a conversation. I asked him, what work does he do? He said, it's Afa. I said, Afa. I have had that one. What work do you do? There is in this in this community there is no house you get to you don't see Afa. Afa is everywhere. That one is, is that one is normal. What is your work? Ah, he said he doesn't do any other work, it's Afa. Okay. You didn't go to school, he said no. You didn't learn any trade. He said, no. Okay. He just needs money. But before I can give my money to somebody, I, I need to know who you are. So I began to ask him more questions. You have children, you said. He said, yes. What school do they attend? He said they go to Elikew Islamic school. I said, Oh, okay. What trade what trade are you also training them in? No trade. They don't go to any other school. He said no. So I shook my head. And I said, you know. The foolishness of your fathers, you have inherited it. Your fathers put you through life without any preparation. They didn't prepare you to survive. They made you a non-entity, a beggar. Because they didn't put any trade in your hands. They didn't put any strength in your hands. So you are just an afar. Just afar. Now your children, I don't know how many they are, you are already putting them in the same disadvantage. Now their own will be worse than your own. Because by their own time, it will become more difficult for afars to survive. So he said, what should he do? I said, I, I know the only thing you want is money. I don't, I, and I don't have money for you. I will give you some food stuff for your family. And I will tell the madmen of our school, this is not the time we allow children to join the school. But I will tell them, if you bring your children, they will allow them to join. Bring your children to school. That's the best I can do for you. And I called my wife. Please, arrange food stuff for this man. He collected the food stuff and disappeared. The children never came to school. And I'm sure they didn't go to any other school. It's a terrible problem. That you have children and you don't put them through school. You don't give them any trade, any training for tomorrow. Just uh, Islamic school. Anyhow, let me not be talking too much on their own side. Let me shift to our side 
we send our children to school. But many of us you just put your child in school. You don't have time for them. You don't check through their works. You don't look at what they do in the school. You don't see they are going to school as an investment. You start a business. You pay attention to your business. You look at it. You look at what is happening there. But when you send your children to school, you don't check it up. Because you don't value the education of your children. You don't see it as an investment into your future. You, you, there's no child who can learn anything out of school except you supervise them. You have to supervise them. Even if you put your children in the best school, the most expensive school, that does not make them the best kids. You need to check what they are doing. Every day, ask them, what did you do in school today? Let them show you what they did in school. Make sure they are, they are paying attention to it. Even if you are not educated, ask them, what did you do in school today? Let him come and tell you what they do in school. Tomorrow, ask him again. He cannot repeat what he told you yesterday. So he must be learning new things, at least to have something to tell you. Give attention to your children. You don't make the best for your children. You don't make your children the best by putting them in the best school. No. Average school is good enough. But check what they are doing. Go to their school from time to time to check if they are in school. Check to see. Let's hear what the teachers say about your kid. Education is very important for our children. I have discovered that there is no kid who cannot do well in life if you give attention to them. Don't compel them to study what they are not capable of. Sciences is good, but it's not better than arts. It's not better than any other one. What your kid is capable of doing is the best for him. If your kid knows how to draw, let him go in that direction. If he's good in uh, his hand, using his hand to do things, then let him go in that direction. There are many dimensions of education that will help your children identify his own best. There is none that is better than the other. Number five, don't use your children as sex slaves. Nabi, in 1996, I was pastor over a church in Ojo, in Ibadan here. And we had a convert. When that girl filled the form and said she was 18 years old. The person who handled her as, a, as counselor was confused. Even me, I was confused because I thought she should be around 34. I asked my counselor, he said he was expecting her to be like 32, 34 also. But she said she's 18 years old. So, but we can't argue with her about her age. So, we just note her 18. But I put question mark there. Because I was wondering. One of the days during the following week, the peace of my office was troubled when a woman arrived. While at the office, me, Jonah, the noise she was making made me to come out right away. Now, who be pastor for this place? Who be pastor? Now, who be pastor here? And uh, my secretary or whatever she was was trying to pacify. Any suru, mama? Kilo you know. I don't want to see you. No be you, I won't see. Now, pastor, 
Who be pastor? Who be pastor? So I knew, I knew if I don't come out on time, this one will scatter everything. So I came out quickly. Madam, waiting with the problem. Now you be pastor, and she grabbed my clothes. Ah, hey, hey. this is getting serious. So. Now you be pastor. Now you convert my daughter. Now you convert my daughter. Now you convert my daughter. Now, you my daughter. now me and you today. <laughs> it was an interesting incident. It took us about 15 minutes before we could understand what she was talking about. What was she fighting with me for? So you convert my daughter. How you go convert my daughter? You know, see other girl. You know, see other people for grand. Now my own daughter. Sit down. <laughs> uh, the the gauge who got converted on Sunday was her daughter. That we were thinking should be 34 and said she was 18. This woman was a prostitute. But her business was no longer booming as before. You know? Customers got tired of her because she was growing older and she she was no longer selling. So she was smart enough since she knew she had a daughter. She, and she noticed the way those men were paying attention to her daughter. So she pushed her daughter into the business. And she became the pimp. So she was the one arranging the men for the girl. This girl was the one sleeping with the men. The mother was the one collecting the money. Now the daughter got saved on Sunday. And she got home and said, Praise God. I just accepted Jesus for my life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away. <laughs> All things have become new. Now I understood why she was making the noise. Because food supply ceased. The girl, as the mama was making noise, fighting, you know, the girl already knew that her mother came to church. So she followed her. So she arrived also. And then she started fighting with her mother. Now, you be useless, mama. You are useless woman. You this useless woman. And, oh my God, it was interesting. It was an interesting matter to watch. And this girl began to narrate her life. She said, the first time man slept with her, she was six years old. It was one of the men that came to see her mother that raped her. And the mama just collected money from the man. And the man went away. And since that time, the woman had been arranging men to sleep with her. He said, at least in a day, she will sleep with ten people. At least ten. Arranged by her mother. He said, now I give my life to Christ with the fight. Even all the money you collect, you ever give them to me? And it was an interesting scene in my church, in our church that day. Well, maybe you didn't enlist your own children as prostitutes. 
But you sent her to become a house help somewhere. Do you know what they do to her? As house help? Huh? A small girl that should be in school because of your own selfish interest. You send her to go and be doing house help. There was this, this one, I was listening to her story on the radio the other time. He said she's pregnant. She doesn't know who, who got her pregnant. So they were asking her, who is, who had been sleeping with her? He said, daddy, daddy normally comes. And, uh, daddy's son also always come. They just come. They will grab her by the throat and sleep with her. She's house help. Her mother is uh, somewhere in uh, Delta State. She doesn't even know the name of, her, of their, their town. She doesn't even know the place. She, you know, they brought her since she was a tiny girl. And these people just, you know, because nobody cares for her. They can do what they like with her. Just because a mother is senseless enough to throw her child away like that. It's abusive. Some of you, you don't, you are not sending your children as house help. But you send them around, small girls to go and be hawking, hawking things. Hawking things. In our society, this is our evil society. You send your child to go, a small child, even a grown up that is hawking, is she safe? You now send your small child to go and be hawking things. All you have done is, is you have turned out to a, a sex slave. If you can't send your children to school, at least let them go and acquire a trade under your care. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let me add one more before I close. Sending them away from home in tender ages. Sending them. Not driving. Sending. Sending them away from home in tender ages. It's also abusive. Now this is another dimension of child abuse. It's common with, I've, I've spoken about the poor people who send their children as house help, who send them as hawkers and so on. But the rich also do their own. You are quick to send them to hostels. Or even send them abroad. Because you have enough money to pay the bills. You send your child to go and be in London. In Manchester, in uh, somewhere, you are in Nigeria. You and your wife, you live here, or your child is there, and you are proud. You think you have done something great. You think you are building a future for them. By my position as a minister, people come to see me. They bring their problems to me. People who did what you are doing now in the past. Many of them come to see me with their problems because those children, they will always bring trouble upon them. It's a normal thing. Many elites are eager to do this without understanding the implications, without understanding the troubles that are inherent. It's worse for you to send your children to countries where they have access to anything and everything without any control. They have access to everything. They have access to anything. And you are not there to control them. Nobody is there to control them. So they, they get exposed to all kinds of things. Ask people who have done it before if they will be sincere with you. 
they will tell you that it is a great way to turn your children wild. Some of them will become addicted to drugs. Some will join gangsters. Some will become prostitutes. They will do all kinds of terrible things. Take care of your children by yourself. Let them stay with you. By the grace of God, my children have documents to live in any country they want to live. God gave us that favor. We, I thank God for my uh, parents-in-law, you know, they bequeathed that to our children. My children can live anywhere in the world. Okay? But we had a principle in our family. Before a child we go abroad to live, he must have finished his first degree. He must have grown up enough to know his left from his right. Because I can't go with you to stay in London. I can't go with you to stay in America. I live in Nigeria. And I'm your father. I have a role to play in your life that I cannot play in proxy. You have to stay with me for me to play that role in your life. So, I'm sorry, you cannot go to live anywhere else until you finish your first degree. It's our policy in our home. And we have followed it completely. That's why I am proud of my children today. Maybe if I had allowed them to travel when they were small, they would no longer be under my coordination. There will be another set of kids. It is you and you alone that can care for your children. And that's what the Bible actually asks us to do. It's ab- abusive to cut your children away. To cut them out. You are tired of paying attention to your children. You know, when you have kids, they are small. They are placing much demands on you. At that time, you feel like, oh, these kids are disturbing me. The same way they are disturbing you is the same way they will honor you tomorrow. That same way they are disturbing you now is the same way they will be sending blessings to you. Ask parents who who have children and took care of them. They will tell you what they have. Our children will be sending. This one will send. That one will send. That one will send. You won't be ashamed because you have children who are enabling you. Well, there are many sides to children abuse in Nigeria. And we can't possibly talk about everything in one message. I have only six identified today because of the brevity of my time. And what I need you to know is that as you lay your bed, so you will lie on it. Stop abusing your children. They are your glory for tomorrow. There's a song. Somebody sang a song. Even though you are looking at me and look like I'm weak. It's not that I'm weak. I'm waiting for my children. I'm investing on my children. It's because of my children that I'm investing on. That's why I'm not able to do so much. You may not be able to buy clothes like your friends are buying clothes. You may not be able to all these and call clothes that they buy. All those... uh, You may not be able to buy all of that. Because you are investing on your children. 
But the time for your going is going to come later. Children won't always be children forever. The time will come that the children have become, they have become great. At that time, you are no longer paying their school fees. They are the ones sending money to you. Rise up, you are going to pray. My children shall be greater than me in Jesus' name. Can you pray that prayer? My children shall be greater than me. In the name of Jesus. Are you praying? Maybe because you don't have children yet. You don't want to pray. <laughs> you can deposit prayer before the, the right time. My children will be greater than me in Jesus' name. Make them greater than me. Make them greater than me. Make them greater than me. Then you are going to pray. Teach me to bring them up in the fear of God. Teach me to bring them up in the fear of God. Teach me. Teach me. Some of you, you have already messed up. You have done things wrongly already. But it is God that can help you culture it. So tell him, help me to culture my, my life. You already have children without a husband? You already have plenty of children all over? Ask God to help you culture them. The mercy of God can intervene for anyone. Pray. 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 Ask for help from above.